guess what? Good news, everyone. Democracy just kicked MAGA's ass. See, now these polls matter and count. Democracy wins in Ohio, in Virginia, Senate and House, in Kentucky, in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania. Andy Bashir for president. Skyler Van Valkenburg for president. Actually, Joe Biden for president. There is extraordinarily good polling for him, just in that you have not heard about anywhere, and a way to sell his accomplishments and kick Trump's ass in the same ads because what, after all, is Biden's greatest accomplishment? But first, on the scoreboard, clean sweep. Down goes MAGA! Down goes MAGA! And Virginia Democrats just knocked the down out of Glenn Youngkin, the human red vest. Start there. The Republicans actually expected they would retain the House and flip the Senate, and they got nothing. The Democrats retained the Virginia State Senate with a margin of at least two votes, maybe three. And at 11.04 Eastern, prevailing local time, Michael Feggins was projected as the winner in District 97. And thus, the worst they could do would be a 51-49 Democratic majority in the Virginia House of Delegates, with several seats still undecided. An hour earlier, Skyler Van Valkenburg... He, too, owns a vest. He's just a teacher. Won the 16th district, clinching the tie and absolutely eviscerating the Republican Party of Virginia as the Dems now control both houses there. And now this brief promotional message available at deep discounts, carload lots of Youngkin 2024 baseball caps. Any offer accepted. In Ohio last night, it may have finally dawned on Republicans that their success in stealing the Supreme Court and overturning Roe v. Wade has transformed them into a version of the myth of Sisyphus, forever pushing the same rock up the same hill to reach the top, only to see the rock roll right back down, rolling over them and crushing them in the process. The issue is obviously far more than the politics. It is human rights and forced birthing and the cutting edge of the repression of women back towards 18th and 19th century standards and maybe even a future handmaid's tale society. But politically, abortion rights are a goddamned rock that will continue to roll over the Republicans for the foreseeable future. Insisting you are going to ban abortion is a winner for energizing your base. Actually banning abortion is a winner for energizing your opponent and converting a surprisingly large part of your base. Ohio Issue 1 putting abortion rights into the state constitution, not only one, but it won by at least 57 to 43. And by the way, Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee and Act Blue and the Biden re-election campaign and everybody else, Sherrod Brown is up for re-election next year. Maybe you want to put some money into his campaign now? Maybe you want to put more money for the Biden Ohio campaign now because that rock is ready to roll back down over Sisyphus, the goddamn Republican again, isn't it? In Kentucky, meantime, Daniel Cameron started the night as the prospective less crazy African-American face of the Republican Party. By 930, he had conceded with no obvious political future in line. Democratic Governor Andy Beshear kicked his ass by at least 52 to 47. Four years ago, Beshear had won election over the incumbent Republican by just 4,000 votes, by just 0.2 percent. What was that incumbent's name again? I can't remember. What was the name of the guy Bashir beat last night? I can't remember him either. And just to rub it in a little bit more, Republicans in Pennsylvania lost a seat on the Supreme Court they thought they might get. It was four to two Democrats, then there was the death of a Democratic member, and the Democrats regained it last night. And again, that Supreme Court is five to two Democrat. 
New Jersey may have been slightly high on swamp gas when Republicans murmured this, but they really thought they might flip the state assembly there. Instead, they will lose seats in New Jersey, including the safest, reddest district in the state, where Assemblyman Ned, could I have a more white bread name, Thompson, lost to Avi Schnall by like 6%. A Republican disaster. 100% Democratic victories. That was what the night was in whole. An absolute disaster and an absolute reminder of many things. One, polls are guidance and often useful guidance, but only elections count. Two, Republicans continue to lose virtually all toss-up elections and are now beginning to lose some of the safe ones as well. Three, under Trump, the state-level GOP has gone backwards, and it's not just the nut jobs who are being wiped out by his diseased mind. And four, our broken, embittered, traditional news media may not be salvageable. David Shalian is the CNN political director who bought into, hyped, and then defended the indefensible live fellating of Trump on CNN last spring. David Shalian was one of those political reporters who then violated all precepts of independence and of maintaining the appearance that you cannot be compromised by having dinner with three Trump campaigners, including Jason Miller, the night before the first Republican debate in Milwaukee. And as the Democrats, as democracy, kicked Republican ass last night, David Shalian, CNN political director, got on his network and announced, quote, what we're seeing tonight is the Democratic brand isn't in trouble here. Joe Biden is in trouble here. CNN then segued off the astonishing Democratic sweep to stop covering it and instead to go back to hyping their own polling released earlier in the day, which I'll go into detail on later, with this clown Shalian then emphasizing only those numbers that were not positive for President Biden. David Shalian is a whore, the worst of the both sides access reporters who understand only the sounds of words and not their meanings. If CNN wants to come back from its deathbed, it needs to fire David Shalian and start reporting reality again. See what is before you and just say it. Oh, and by the way, the poll from yesterday to watch was not David Shalian's at CNN. It was from a company called Signal, because what we saw last night was the Democratic brand isn't in trouble here. Mainstream political reporting and especially CNN is in trouble here. Meanwhile, Dementia J. Trump has managed to go both crazy and stochastic in the same online post. It's the Elmer J. Fudd stuff again about the New York fraud trial that resumes today with Girl Jr. testifying. He begins with, quote, I am worth billions of dollars more than what is on my financial statements. And then ends with Lord only knows what number rhetorical question about ridding him of the turbulent priests it is a mockery of our judicial and legal system something must be done to stop the fascists parts of the capital briefly went into mini lockdowns yesterday as a 21 year old atlanta man carrying a weapon variously described as a long gun a rifle and an ar-15 was subdued by dc capitol police constant trump drumbeat of something must be done and a guy walks around the Capitol with a rifle coincidence no doubt back to the new york case and america's leading parking lot legal scholar says that they will be making a series of post-trial motions based in large part on her claim that judge engeron wouldn't let trump talk enough in court oh they let him talk enough that's how he confessed quoting alina haba there should be a mistrial and she will be filing for one because of all the ethical issues she and Trump have been gagged over, which implies she means there should be a mistrial because of Judge Engeron's clerk, who they have decided to scapegoat and slander because she once took a selfie with Chuck Schumer. There is a judicial code of ethics, Elena Haba says. Those ethics extend to the entire courtroom. She then threatened to go after the judge's bar license, and kept repeating the word ethics 
and her lesson on ethics came in an interview with Larry Kudlow, who was Trump's director of the National Economic Council, but it's perfectly ethical for him to be on television interviewing Trump's ambulance chaser about how wronged Trump has been in court. There was a minor but important note out of the election subversion case in D.C., one of the endless Trump motions to delay, to delay what you got, anything? It would have pushed a series of pretrial motions back from tomorrow to February 9th, three months, and that would have almost certainly delayed the trial start by weeks, if not by a month or more. She says three months, bite it. You'll get two weeks and you'll like it. Trial still starts March 4th. Be there. Aloha. Back in New York, Haba's mention of a movement to disbar Judge Engeron is ironic in a way because the bland, banal, mediocre face of Trump's dream of military dictatorship, Jeffrey, that's why we have an Insurrection Act, Clark, is finally going to face a disciplinary hearing from the District of Columbia bar, and it will start January 9th. He's managed to delay the thing by just under a year, but that changed yesterday. Of course, nowhere is it written that you have to have a legal license to be the attorney general in an avowedly militaristic, vengeful Department of Justice, and Clark could very well be that if Trump again seizes power. The two biggest pivot points from representative government to authoritarianism were underscored Sunday in that Washington Post piece, I keep telling you to take door to door which I would like to make every American read, just call me Johnny Apple Post. Those two points would be, firstly, the more or less permanent invoking of the Insurrection Act so that the military could be used to shoot civilians at basically any public political assembly. And remember, that military would remain under the control of the president as commander-in-chief. And secondly... The unapologetic politicizing of the Department of Justice, which Jeff Clark, of course, tried to make happen after Trump lost and even after the January 6th coup failed. There would be no failure this time. And it would be the trivial men, the boring, little, unkempt mediocrities like Jeff Clark, who would happily erase the freedoms and count the dead bodies and convince themselves it was patriotic constitutionalism. If your nightmares on this front are not fetid enough, the Post followed up last night with an analysis of some of the stuff they left out on Sunday, which others have reported. They put a really stupid headline on it. I'll get back to that in Worse Persons. But they added to the list of the aspects of a Trump dictatorship, the way that he could wipe out entire autonomous federal agencies and even neuter Congress by simply declaring that entities like the Federal Trade Commission or the FCC or even the Federal Reserve, were now under the direct control of the president. And what are you going to do about it? If he wants to try a little harder to not make it look like a monarchy, he could simply invoke the plan to fire anybody deemed disloyal at any agency and replace them with a member of the Trump Nazi party, then insist by executive order that all agencies submit any planned actions to the White House for review and approval first. And just to wind it all up, the Post happily notes, he, quote, could refuse to spend money on programs, Congress funds, but he doesn't favor. Even the Post has not stated it yet. I don't think anybody will. But while they are doing such a good job depicting Doomsday, we might as well address the elephant in the room. Well, one of the 800 or so elephants. There is no doubt at all that if Trump regains power, he will not give it up voluntarily. And the point of the Jeffrey Clarks and the John Eastmans and the Kenneth Chesbros and the other night crawlers and anti-democracy vampires is to polish the turd that is Trump and make it look legal. And thus the first dictatorial move by a restored Trump would be an excuse for him to violate the 22nd Amendment and run for a third term or, hearkening back to his complaints of four and five years ago, to simply be given a third term because he was so falsely accused of all those crimes that he actually committed, and his conspiracy with Russia that didn't happen, oh yeah, it did. Or, even more simply, really simplify this by simply canceling that pesky 2028 election, or the ones after it, based on 
Let's see. They already made up something they call presidential immunity. What about um, presidential do-overs? And on that unhappy note, here's something unexpectedly happy. There is new polling showing unexpected growth for President Biden. Not the poll from CNN last night, but the one from Signal. Signal? C-Y-G-N-A-L. Woo! Let me do the CNN one first, because it makes the Signal poll all the sweeter, especially when it turns out that Signal lands center-right on the political spectrum. And they have the good news for President Biden. The CNN poll again centers on the useless general national voter poll that it's 49-45 Trump. And as I have been saying since I started in this in 1997, this particular number is useless. And I do not know why we produce this number or do polling on it because Americans collectively do not elect the president. Americans in the individual states do. And not even them sometimes, if you believe Eastman. So only state-by-state opinion polling is of any real value. And even then, they are polls, as the one in the Times Sunday. And they are polls from a year out. And virtually every incumbent president a year out has looked like absolute flaming crap. There are... Two interesting and useful interior numbers in the CNN poll. Latino voters are only 50 to 46 Biden. And that confirms a lot of other polling. And I do think a little money spent on Trump's glittering history of hating all Latinos, particularly Mexicans, would push that much closer to the 33 points by which Biden won that demo in 2020. Apart from that, there is also the adamantine number. CNN's poll finds 51% of voters saying there is no chance at all that they would vote for Joe Biden. 48% say there is no chance at all that they would vote for Dementia J. Trump. Ominous to be sure, except that the mirror image number is reversed. Only 2% who do not currently support Trump say they would consider supporting Trump. Double that, 4% who don't currently support Biden say they would consider supporting Biden. In a field in which one patch of tiny crocuses sprouting valiantly upwards constitutes a bumper crop, this is the only sign of any opportunity for growth for anybody, and it's Biden's. And it's a year out. And as if to underscore this, there was this other poll yesterday that shows unexpected improvements for Joe Biden. This is from the pollster called Signal, which I had never heard of, and has largely done state polls and is largely considered right wing, but not crazy right wing, more centrist, one that the Republican campaigns actually turn to when they want to know the real numbers, not the ones they're telling everybody else. You can usually find out a lot about these companies and where their prejudices might lie with minimal research. And now there are scorecards everywhere. And most impressively to me, Signal pretty much nailed the Republicans' underperformance in the congressional races last year in two late polls before Election Day, even though it is a right-leaning service. And it gets an A rating and a 94% correct score from 538 before you go, oh, Christ, Nate Silver again. A, you don't have to tell me about Nate Silver. It's my fault. I was the first guy to put him on TV to talk about anything more complicated than baseball stats. B, anyway, ABC gutted 538 last spring. But C, whatever it has lacked in common sense, 538 has been really good at evaluating other pollsters. All right. Anyway, Signal is showing Biden growth. Not only does Signal have the meaningless national number, but it has it at 47.45 Biden as of November 1st. But it concludes Joe Biden's image noticeably improved since last month. It says he was at 45 favorable, 53 unfavorable in October, but is now 47 favorable, 50 unfavorable. That's a five point improvement in one month. The pollster concludes, somewhat against the conventional wisdom, that this growth for Joe Biden likely owes to the Israel-Gaza war. 
There's also something else funky in this signal poll. A month ago, those voters who said that one of their top priorities was national security were breaking for Trump 59 to 35. Now it's 53 to 38 Trump, and that is a nine point bump for Biden in one month. Plus, it's more than that. The number of those who put national security among their top priorities doubled to 10 percent. And, and one more flashback to math class, which I would still be in for like the 43rd consecutive year if it hadn't been for Mr. Murphy giving me a pass when we got to trigonometry. For two years, per this signal poll, one topic has dominated that list of voter priorities. It was more than double any other concern all that time. As recently as last December, it was at 42% when nothing else was at more than 12%. All summer, this one subject was at the 35 to 36% range, and then it hit its peak and began to drop. And it is, as of the first of this month, down to 30.9%. Was 42%, is under 31% in a couple of months, and the topic is inflation. And bluntly, if inflation continues to drop or it doesn't, and just voters' concerns about inflation continues to drop, everything else from Biden's age to the intractability of the Trump cult will also drop in importance. All of which makes for an interesting backdrop to another story a Politico report yesterday, that the Biden team now has enough data to assess its first advertising campaign, the one that began in August, the one positively emphasizing his success and the serious issues, $7 million worth of those ads, and de-emphasizing Trump, $100,000 worth of those ads, and it hasn't worked. They were counting on Trump's rivals to attack Trump for them. They could stay above the fray. And guess what? Trump's rivals largely have not attacked Trump. Although with tonight's latest Republican debate officially signaling the start of desperation season, they might yet. Still, there is a lesson in here and there is plenty of time to learn it and use it. Politico reports that while lots of Biden-adjacent strategists and advocates and, you know, just anybody who likes not living in a fascist state, while they have been telling the campaign to go full dark Brandon and spend a lot of money on tearing Trump to shreds, the campaign is still quoted as saying there have been no changes to the strategy and there will not be and just read our memo. And yet, in the entirety of his presidency... When has Joe Biden seemed the most vivid to you? When has he seemed the most presidential? When has he seemed the youngest? When has he seemed the realest? To me, I have no doubt. It was last year, September 1st, 2022, the defense of democracy speech, the battle for the soul of the nation speech in Philadelphia. Joe Biden's greatest accomplishment, after all, is and would remain even if he knocked inflation down to 0.1 percent and solved Gaza by giving everybody exactly what they wanted and distributed a free iPhone to everybody over the age of 12. His greatest accomplishment, his true brand the thing that should be the centerpiece of his success in the advertising about his success, his legacy is beating Trump. Run with it. I have said it here before. I will always love Joe Biden. Of all the politicians I have ever met, he is the closest to an ordinary American human being. And if beating Trump means he's the candidate, he's the candidate. If beating Trump means Rachel Maddow is the candidate, she's the candidate. I don't care. 
I didn't care if it was Obama or Hillary in 2008 when the nation had to beat the Republicans. I didn't pick a side until Hillary started running those Republican-like ads. I did not care. I don't care now. But there should be in the heart of all of us who want to defeat Trump and the Trump cult and in fact understand the existential necessity of beating them, there should be the consideration that the soggy Biden poll numbers and the concerns about his age may not, in fact, reflect support for Trump. They may reflect disappointment that the thing we will always cherish about Joe Biden, that hopefully they will build statues of Biden for, that thing he's not running on. He beat Trump. Did you beat Trump? Did I beat Trump? Hell no. Joe Biden beat Trump. The lack of excitement now, the lack of enthusiasm, the middle of the night doubts, they may not, as so many of my friends fear, and sometimes I fear, they may not be an expression of America morally broken and unfixable. They may not show actual support for Trump. They may simply be recognitions of what is demonstrably true. Trump is a master at filling up all the space in the room of exciting both those who obey him and those who hate him. Joe, you beat him. You're the only one who has. We need you to do it again. And we need you to tell everybody that. Not only why he and the evil he personifies and spreads must be defeated, but bluntly, Joe, you have to tell everybody again that you did it before and you will do it again that you are the man to beat the ever-loving shit out of Donald Trump. Also of interest here, one of the leaders of the move to censure Congresswoman Tlaib for hateful speech is an Ohio congressman and former Trump administration flying monkey who a month ago said that, quote, we were going to turn Gaza into a, quote, parking lot because, of course, Hate by non-Trumpists should be censured and punished, but hate by Trumpists is A-OK. -okay. That's next. This is an all-new edition of Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In sports, Dateline, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hello. <laughs> Told you yesterday, Craig Council had jumped from manager of the Milwaukee Brewers to manager of the Chicago Cubs, more than doubling his salary in the process and basically doubling the all-time record for highest paid baseball manager ever. And in nine years as a baseball manager, he has lost five of the six playoff series he's gone to, so who knows? Now comes the blowback at Craig Council Park, home of the Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin Little League. Somebody has defaced the sign, spray painting the word ass over the name Craig Council. Any suspects? Well, Brewers owner Mark Atanasio had a surprisingly harsh response to Council's departure, saying at his news conference yesterday, quote, We're all here today because we lost Craig, but I've reflected on this. Craig has lost us, and he's lost our community also. In Wisconsin, those are swear words. <laughs> Dateline Mexico City, you think baseball managers don't matter? The president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, at a news conference, rough translation, the San Diego Padres owners are looking for a new manager, he said. Benji Gill led us to third place in the World Baseball Classic. He's top class. <laughs> 
and Dateline Norfolk, Virginia, headquarters of Diamond Sports Group, the outfit that took over as Bally's TV sports operation went bankrupt. I mentioned that the infrastructure supporting American sports leagues, ever increasing revenues from TV, that infrastructure is disintegrating before our eyes with immediate impact. The network carrying those San Diego Padres that the president of Mexico mentioned went under last spring. The Padres basically made no money off their TV broadcasts this year. By September, they needed to take a $50 million loan just to make payroll. In October, they let their high-priced manager leave for another job in San Francisco. Now, the Padres are shopping some of their high-priced players. You will not convince me this is not all because of the TV revenue loss. Next, the National Basketball Association. Diamond Sports yesterday announced an agreement with the NBA by which it will continue to televise the games of 15 different basketball teams through this season, and then the rights will revert to the league and the teams. Diamond Sports also says it intends to make a similar deal with the National Hockey League. It'll broadcast those 11 teams' games this season, and then adios. Sounds all like a business deal. In fact, it's bad news. I mean, we're talking about the L.A. Clippers and the Dallas Mavericks. And the last word was Diamond was interested in continuing with some teams on a team-by-team basis if they were willing to take 20% less. Since sports salaries don't go down, they have not gone down in baseball since the Federal League folded, and that was in 1916, and owners never accept a lack of profit Guess from whom the owners and the players intend to find that 20% that television isn't going to give them anymore? Hmm, I wonder who they have in mind. Still ahead on this all-new edition of Countdown, I swear this is true, I swear it's true, the New York Marathon, the road race, was Sunday. Today is Wednesday, yes, and still on the streets of New York, I am walking past people who ran the marathon and are still wearing their gold medals around their necks, indicating that they ran the marathon. Once, the New York City Marathon was so trivial that the head of the race called me up and begged me to do a preview of it on CNN, and frankly, there were more people running in the marathon than watching CNN at that point. Which I guess is the situation now, too. Anyway, things I promised not to tell, brand new edition coming up. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. Worse, the Washington Post. On Sunday, The Post did, and I repeated the highlights here yesterday, an excellent and chilling piece on Trump's plan for dictatorship if this nation is insane enough to put him back in the White House. You know, politicizing the Department of Justice and calling out the troops to shoot peaceful protesters on the streets. Yesterday, The Post followed this up with an analysis of its own piece. It was a good analysis by Aaron Blake. But the headline that some idiot slapped atop the Blake analysis is everything that is wrong with American journalism and indeed with America. It is the both sidesist weasel wording that may yet put Trump back in power because it does not recognize that this is not the way it is supposed to be in this country. The headline on this post analysis of an imminent dystopian Trumpian America Five Ways Trump and Allies Plan for a More Authoritarian Second Term, which is the exact template, the exact structural phrasing of every Washington Post travel piece. Five places to see on your way to Colonial Williamsburg, or even five recipes for pumpkin spice you can prepare at home, or five ways Trump plans to destroy the country and the world. You can't sugarcoat these stories anymore, Post. Democracy does not die in darkness. It dies in a Trump victory. Say it. It'll be your last chance to. Worser, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson 
Speaking of the guys are going to destroy the country, again with Mike Johnson. This is the shady finances part of the scandals. The new claim is, oh, he does too have a checking account. It's not in his financial accountability report because it isn't paying him any interest, so he doesn't have to report it. But now, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Crew, reports Johnson also has a mortgage and a personal loan and a home equity line of credit. And quoting Jason Libowitz of Crew, where did that money go? Well, I'm thinking the answer to that is, is obvious. Johnson is a creationist, believes the Earth was formed in one moment 6,000 years ago. He represented a museum that had its own Noah's Ark, again, that was damaged by flooding. <laughs> Where did all his money go? This guy must have pet dinosaurs to feed. But our worst, Republican Congressman Max Miller of Ohio. I do not have much use for what Congresswoman Tlaib is saying about the Gaza war, but to hear Miller get on the House floor yesterday and tell everybody about how wrong and damaging hate is and how guilty she is of it, when after the attacks, he went on Fox and announced that the future of the Gaza Strip was, quote, we're going to turn that into a parking lot, unquote. This is the essence of being a 21st century MAGA asshole. Congressman Max, your racist fantasies of mass murder should get you expelled. My racist fantasies of mass murder should get me reelected. Miller, today's worst person in the world. Number one story on the countdown and things I promised not to tell, obviously focused on my favorite topic, me. And I swear this is true. New York's marathon was Sunday. The joke goes that you know the marathon. It's your worst neighbor. It occupies all the streets all day. You can't get in. You can't get out. Sometimes you can't even get in anywhere by foot. But that's apart from the main issue here. It's now several days later after the marathon was concluded and on the streets of New York, once again, yesterday, I saw people walking around still wearing their medals from having run the marathon. The New York City Marathon. I have nothing against the New York City Marathon, but I will say this. It's extraordinary to have seen the thing grow as it has since my earliest days as a reporter in the late 70s and early 80s. When I was at CNN, I got a phone call one day from a guy claiming to be the publicist for the New York Marathon, which was a big thing. 10 or 15,000 people would run it every year, but in some places they had to dodge traffic because police would not shut down all the streets for the early years of the New York City Marathon. And the publicist said, look, if you'd like to talk to our founder, Fred Lebo, who invented this and got it off the ground as a rival to the Boston Marathon, or if you'd like to talk to Bill Rogers, who's running in it and is internationally famous as a runner, or several other internationally famous American runners, we can arrange this for you. If you'd like to just call us in the office when you have time to come talk to us, we'll make it happen. And I called. And I got this answer. Hello, New York City Marathon. I said, yes, hi, uh, Fred Lebo's office, please. And the man said, speaking. The head of the New York City Marathon was answering the switchboard. And it soon proved that Fred Lebo was the same guy who had posed as the publicist. He was, in fact, the entirety of the management structure of the New York City Marathon as of 1982, I guess. The first time I would have covered the race. And when I said CNN was interested in doing a preview of the New York Marathon, oh, that's great, he said in a rather thick European accent. That's great. When would you like us to meet you? And I said, well, don't you have a set press time or schedule? No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll arrange it for you. When can you be here? It was literally one of those things. What time do you want to do this? When can you be here? And I said, well, it looks like I can get the crew at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Great. And I said, okay. And then Fred Lebo said, where would you like us to be? That's where the New York City Marathon was 40 years ago compared to today when they shut down my block and make it impossible for anybody who does not have identification showing that they live there 
to walk through without a special pass. Congratulations on doing that. There's another story from CNN Days. It actually precedes my story. It was one of the first big events that CNN tried to cover live. And again, now the rights to carry the New York Marathon on television live costs millions of dollars and are sold exclusively to whoever. I, I can't imagine anybody actually watching people run as a sporting event, but there it is. Certainly not in a marathon format. It takes a little long. But in those days, if you wanted to put the New York City Marathon on television, all you had to do was point a camera at it. And so the CNN idea was, let's get the start of the marathon from the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Let's put it on live and let's actually try to do something that has never been done before. Let's move our truck and show not just the start of the marathon, but we'll be several hundred yards ahead of the front runners and we'll show that marathon live for 45 seconds or a minute until our signal gives way until we are no longer able to be live that was the thinking so they did this and were surprised and i'm sure this was 1980 right after cnn signed on and sure enough they drove the truck and pointed the camera outside the back window and they got the start of the marathon and the gun going off and this scene of people running towards the truck and then suddenly the signal was lost and there was this sound heard before the signal was lost oh sh and that was it what had happened was in those days to do a live signal from a moving truck you couldn't just stick up a little antenna which you can do now, you had to have a whole, essentially, arm sticking up, a six-foot-tall mast that had to stick up above the truck. Like, well, you know when the electricity company comes to repair your downed power lines? One of those things. It, it didn't have a cage at the top of it for somebody to stand in, but it would have supported somebody easily. A six-foot-tall, probably one- or two-foot diameter mast. And they were driving along the Verrazano Narrows Bridge with it and didn't realize that there were low-lying overpasses on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge for maintenance and painting and whatnot. And sure enough, they drove right into one and the damn thing snapped in half. For many years thereafter, Mary Alice Williams, who was the main CNN anchor in New York and also the vice president of the company and also the bureau chief of CNN in New York, had framed on her wall what looked to be something left over from a drain at somebody's house. It was a bent piece of metal with a damage mark in the middle. She had it framed on her wall. And I once asked her what it was, and that's how I know this story, because what it was was the CNN live truck mast that got snapped in half while they were covering the 1980 New York City Marathon live. The New York Marathon, of course, was also the home of Rosie Ruiz, who later claimed to have been the winner of the Boston Marathon. She'd gotten into the Boston Marathon by claiming she had run in the New York City Marathon. And then it turned out in both races... The reason she had done so well when she was not internationally known nor ranked nor known to have run a race in less than three hours, Rosie Ruiz, in both the New York City Marathon and the Boston Marathon of the 80s, solved the problem that faces so many, many runners. Those dead spots. When you hit the so-called wall, she got around the wall by traveling part of the route via subway. In fact, she met up unintentionally, obviously, with one of the reporters who covered her as she was being given the laurels for winning one of the marathons. And one of the reporters said, wait a minute, I saw that woman on the subway on my way over here. And that's how the whole Rosie Ruiz story unraveled. Later efforts to promote the New York Marathon introduced me to a man I have mentioned here before, Abel Kiviat. Abel Kiviat was one of the top milers in American uh, track and field in the early years of the 20th century, I mean 1910. He was a guy from Queens with a remarkable accent, and his 90th birthday coincided with a day they wanted to publicize the New York Marathon. So the publicity for this was at the Guggenheim Museum, which was only half as old as Abel was, and Abel came down and talked with this remarkable Queens accent, and he was telling us stories about how he won a race in Waltham, Massachusetts in 1910, and he still had the clock that they gave 
him the watch they gave him for winning the race. And he said, runs a damn sight better than I do. And then we went outside and my producer had this great idea that we get to able to run a couple of steps down Fifth Avenue. And we'd put that in the piece. And of course, Abel, who was still running for health reasons, Abel decided that he would show us exactly what a 90-year-old man could do while running, and he shot past the cameraman, and we had to ask him to do it again, because he was about 54 times faster than the cameraman mentioned or thought was going to happen. And Abel Kvyat, the most interesting part of this, and I wish I had gone even into more detail with him than I did back in those days in 1982 when I got to interview him, Abel Kvyat revealed he had been Jim Thorpe's roommate at the 1912 Olympics. I have told the story in great depth, and I won't do, do so here, but he said basically that Jim Thorpe could do anything you could do better than you could do it, and all he needed was to watch you do it two or three times. He said literally he could take that microphone out of your hands, and a couple of days from now he'd be better at it than you would be. And I said, well, I don't doubt that, but give me a better example of it. And he told the story of how one night all the English and the American athletes were trying to jump up and touch the bottom prong of a chandelier, or as he said it, very endearingly, just like both of my Bronx, New York grandparents, the chandelier, the bottom of the chandelier. He said they were all having a nice time on board the ship in which they lived at the 1912 Olympics, and Thorpe was out drinking on the town somewhere back on the mainland, and he came out on a boat and back to their, their boat that they were occupying, the ship they were all living on. And all night, all of the great athletes of the world, including all the high jumpers, tried to reach up and grab the bottom of this chandelier, just touch it. And now there was a pool of perhaps several hundred dollars, sitting in a hat on the floor. Thorpe, he says, staggers in, looks up at the scene and goes, what's going on, fellas? They explain it to him and he goes, oh, okay. He takes off his jacket. He does not take off his vest. He unbuttons it and simply steps back three steps. And as Abel described it, he doesn't even do a run and start. He just reaches up and grabs the bottom piece of the chandelier and hangs on to it, and we think the whole damn thing's coming down on top of us. He lets go after a few seconds, and in one sweeping gesture, he reaches down, takes the hat, turns it over, grabs all the bills as they fall, stuffs them in his pocket, puts his own hat back on his head and says, have a good night, gentlemen. That was who Jim Torp was. All right, so that's the New York Marathon. And if I think of the New York Marathon, I necessarily think of the Los Angeles Marathon, which started when I was a sportscaster in L.A., and I was working for the radio station that somehow got the rights, I suspect we were paid to do this, got the rights to do radio play-by-play -play of a marathon. Now think about this once. In high school, I once tried to do radio play-by-play -play of a swim meet, which is really problematic if you lose your indications of who is in which lane because the swimmers go underwater. But... Try to do eight or ten hours of live coverage of a marathon on a news radio station. That's what we did. And since I was the sportscaster, they made me co-anchor with the lead newscaster. And we set up in front of a gas station. That's what it was. A gas station near the start line of the Los Angeles Marathon, right next to the Coliseum in downtown L.A. And... At just the beginning of the race, two minutes beforehand, they said, by the way, we want you, Keith, we want you to do the play-by-play -play of the race starting. And I said, from where? They said, from right here. And I said, uh, I, I can't even see the starting line from here. We're going to see them all run past us, but we're, I don't know, a thousand yards from the start of the race. I mean, I can see them all down there. What do you want me to say? And they said, okay, no, we thought of that. We have a solution to it. And one of the engineers produced for me to stand on a folding metal chair that lifted me oh, two and a half feet off the ground. And by the way, it wasn't even steady. And they said, call it from there. And I did not have the heart to tell my producers at KNX Radio in Los Angeles that I couldn't see a damn thing. I just made it up as we went along. But for the next year's race, they had thought about this and remembered the problem that it represented. So they got a wireless mic and they gave it to me and they said, about 10 minutes before the race is supposed to start, we want you to go out 
onto that island that is on the other side of the intersection where the marathon starts. So you'll be 30 yards away from the marathon start line. You'll be facing it. And then we will throw it out to you in 30 or 40 seconds before the gun goes off and you can describe what that looks like. And I can describe what it looks like because I have had this nightmare once a month since the first time we did this in, I think, 1987, with me out in the island 20 or 30 yards away from the front line of the L.A. Marathon, which was at that point maybe 18 or 20,000 people. A gun goes off. You are standing by yourself. You are three inches off the pavement. And suddenly 18 or 20,000 people start running at high speed directly towards you. Think about that one for a while, and you can understand some of the problems that I have had in my life and my career ever since. Persecution problems? Paranoia? If you want them, go stand in front of the traffic island 20, 30 yards in front of a marathon starting and let 18,000 people run at you. Even if you were normal to begin with, and I'm making no claims about that, that will change you in a hurry. Marathons I Have Survived by Keith Olbermann. Things I promised not to tell. Still wearing their medals. Four people at least. On the streets of New York, three days after the race. We get it. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown has come to you from the Vin Scully Studios at the Olbermann Broadcasting Empire in New York. And think about doing eight hours of live coverage of a marathon on radio. And here they come. And there they go. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums. And it was all produced by TKO Brothers. I mean, I would always stay up almost all night Saturday night for the Sunday morning marathon start, worried about what the hell I was going to talk about. Other music, including other Beethoven tunes, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is courtesy of ESPN Inc., and it was written by Mitch Warren Davis. We call it the Olbermann theme from ESPN 2. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Stevie Van Zant. Everything else was pretty much my fault. You know, one thing I do remember about the L.A. Marathon, I think the third year we did it on radio, was I did get a privilege. At one point, they brought over a guest for me to interview about sports in general and Los Angeles in particular and even running, and his name was Muhammad Ali. I'm not sure it was the last interview he was able to give, but his voice was already so closed down by the injuries to his head that I literally had to repeat his answers even though he was talking into my microphone face to face. A very moving and very sad experience, and yet Ali somehow made it special. Anyway, enough. That's Countdown for this, the 1037th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Convict him now while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.